Um, okay, this is week three of our 795, and we are recording this to the cloud. This is um, January 24th. So next week is the final week in January. We'll have Alyssa Wise with us. Alyssa Friend Wise, if you need a friend, she's her middle name is Friend. She's from NYU, and she's got a recent book with Jessica Lester uh, that talks about digital tools uh, for qualitative methodology. So I thought that might be interesting for all of you. Trina is on Fulbright in Poland, so she couldn't be with us. It'll be really late at night, um, her time. So I said, well, I already was planning to get Alyssa. Now I was trying to get actually both of them. But So we have Alyssa next week as a special guest. In a couple of weeks, a few weeks down the road, we'll have one-to-one -one meetings. And I think maybe, just possibly, the students who are in Bloomington itself, I'll try and have a meetup and do those back-to-back -back and face-to-face. -face. Those are EDD students. We'll try and do them online. Uh, and so we'll figure that out in the coming weeks, okay? Um, before we go to Shuya and Yua and Mangwan, do we have any questions from any of you about where we're at or the assignments or if it's going to snow tomorrow? <laughs> Does anyone want to make a prediction how much snow Bloomington is going to get? Two inches. We are two inches. Do I hear one inch? Do I hear? <clears throat> what do you Monroe think? Monroe County is already closed, right? Monroe County schools are already closed, but we may not get any snow at all. Mm -hmm. My recent recent phone um, weather I channel hope. on my phone <laughs> says it rain, but others say six inches of snow. So, mm -hmm. Karen, we're going to have big snow up here in the Midwest coming. It's coming. We're lucky to get this class in. So with, without further ado, um, in 2010, I was teaching a course in room 2101 of the School of Education. To my right-hand side, about two rows back, was the person you see in my middle of my Hollywood squares, Meng Wan, who's now at, working at IUPUI in Indianapolis. Um, she was a master's student, first semester at the time. Yua Ma, who's next to her in my Hollywood Square in the corner, we got a triangle, uh, was my um, master's student as well. And we have um, Shuya here somewhere. I saw her here. Did she leave? I'm here. <laughs> really? I don't see you. Oh. <laughs> well, there you are. I see you now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're just blending in with that white shirt into the background. Yeah. <laughs> was also a master's student in the year 2010, starting the three of them sat next to each other. In the, and Shu was the first one to decide to go for a doctorate. And then Meng Wan did, and maybe you are right after her, or right about the same time, started their um, EDD programs. And Meng Wan started with Dr. Cho as her advisor. I've since become her advisor. I'm Shuya's advisor and I'm on Yua's committee. So I know a little bit about where they're all at. Meng Wan's going to defend, I think, in May, perhaps. I hope. I hope. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> and Shuya defended hers um, three years ago in December 2019. 18, 18, 2018. 18, yes. So that was three years and one month ago. Uh, yeah. In fact, I I was coming back from Taiwan and picked her up in the airport and she flew back with me. She happened to be on the same flight to come to defend her dissertation. So she was the first one of the three. So Shuya, Mengwan, and, and Yua, would you like to fill in the gaps of what I missed, what your interests are in terms of your dissertation? What What is the topic that you're trying to tackle? And then we'll get into more questions about the dissertation process. And then we're gonna split up into two teams and go into breakout rooms. We'll have a PhD breakout room and we'll have an EDD breakout room. I'll join the PhD breakout room. S soon they will join the EDD one. Um, but maybe we'll start with Shuya. You wanna tell us what your dissertation was about and what you're doing now. Um, so um, back in the day, <laughs> I did a. Are you that old, Shia? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but uh, I, I had to dig into my memory a little bit before the session <laughs> I had to, to check all my materials that I had for my dissertation and other things. Uh, so I've been uh, focusing on uh, language, online language learning um, during my doctoral studies. So my dissertation was on a uh, online language learning community called Mixer. Um, I studied how people um, collaborate in the community and uh, uh, what um, what uh, presence they had there and how it helped them with their language learning. She, there are many tools for language learning over the past decade or two. And you may have heard of Rosetta Stone. You may have heard of Life Mocha. You may have heard Chinese Pod, Spanish Pod, English Pod, French Pod, the Spanish Cafe. There are many of these. And the mixer was one from Dickinson College, which uh, incorporated in uh, a couple of different technologies to enable people to correspond. Not Zoom, but before Zoom, we had what Skype. was it? Being Skype, using, right? Using, yeah. So it used Skype to bring in professional instructors instructors to have sessions. So Shuya is now, where are you working at now? Uh, I'm now working at a nonprofit organization called TechSoup. Um, I'm helping the organization to create a lot of learning programs for other nonprofit organizations to take. So all online learning, uh, which is um, very related to <laughs> what I have studied. And also my dissertation, uh, the online community was part of our course program that we are building. Very good. Meng Wan's the next going to be defending. Meng Wan, you want to tell them what your dissertation's on? You're muted. Well, now. let me uh, yeah, turn on my uh, microphone. And if you don't mind, um, just very quickly share my screen. Um, so this is it, the, the, the PowerPoint I used when I defend my proposal, um, the study topic you can see on the screen. Um, so it's a study of faculty members' scaffolding practices for enhanced learning engagement in a social learning platform, um, and which is course networking. Uh, and this is my working context. Um, I have been working for course networking at IUPUI Cyber Lab for almost a decade. <laughs> Uh, right after I graduated from my master's program. Um, so I'm the associate director of research and development on this project. So I have been uh, working with my colleagues on uh, designing, developing, and um, supporting users to use this course networking platform. It's an academic social networking platform. And those of you on the IU campus may know OnCourse, which we used before Canvas, the same person who built the original on course, Ali Jafari, built course networking. And Meng Wan, when she graduated, she got her master's. Um, I just happened the same day or the day after, got a call from Ali. He asked me for a student who's finishing her master's or his master's. And I had the perfect person to recommend about eight years ago or, <laughs> or so. And she's still working Ten there. Years. It's been 10 years you're working there? 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is okay. the 10th year. <laughs> wow. So, you know, sometimes with finding a job is just networking and find the right connections at the right time. Uh, all So Yua, Shuya, and Mengwan all started the same year. All were my mm -hmm. class that year. All came from mainland China. All females from mainland China, starting with them, you know, with finishing their undergrad. All have come back for their doctorates. And, and... All of them have had babies since starting 2010. Oh. So, <laughs> and uh, all girls. <laughs> all, all girls. Meng Wan with two, Shuya with one only, right? Uh, now two. <laughs> two, two. So two, two, and one, right? You are? Okay. So we've got five baby girls since we started, right? And what are their names? You, you are. What's her, what the, what's yours name? Uh, Emily. Emily. What do you got, Meng Wan? Averly and Claire. Averly or Averly? Averly, E V E R L Y. Everly. It's an uncommon name. <laughs> Averly and Ever. Claire. Claire. And Shuya? Uh, Evelyn and Carolyn. Yeah, I met Evelyn, I think, but yeah. not Carolyn. Okay. So, Mua, tell them where, oh, oh um, were you done, Mengwan? Yeah, yeah, as a brief introduction. Yeah. And Shuya, did you want to? 
show your anything slides that you brought before we go to you uh, real quick? Uh, um, can uh, maybe can you go to yeah first? <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I just want to make sure I didn't <laughs> skip over you. You I, I have two computers here. Sorry. Uh, sure. Um, my topic is about studying the um, instructional design professionals' competency in higher education. The reason why I'm interested in studying this field is last year I was in charge of hiring some positions for my um, previous institution. And I've been struggling finding the right candidate. Some of them have the very strong resume, like the, uh, the related experience there, they have like a education, but somehow they just doesn't do the job well. So that's where I kind of interested in studying the competency, especially in higher ed. Um, so that's my research focus. I haven't do my uh, proposal yet. It's due in the draft mode. So, um, but I can share my experience on the qual exam. We actually, Dr. Bong, three of us, we kind of chat a little bit before we join the session. So each of us will take a small section for the three topics. So I'll be talking about the quals today. Okay, and the other two topics are proposal defense and dissertation defense, right? Yes. Okay. So why don't we do all that and then we'll go and we'll see if there are any questions and then we'll go into breakout rooms and have EDD students all go to one breakout and PhDs. So why don't you start us, Yua, with what your experience was with the qualifying exams, then we'll go to dissertation defense with Meng Wan, and then we'll go to dissertation mm, exactly. uh, proposal defense, and then dissertation defense with Shuya. So we'll go in the opposite order way we started. So Yua? Sounds good. I'm going to share my screen. I just, I was just actually still working on this before the session. So, um, so I want to share, this is what happened on that day. So on that day, I'm in central time before 8 a.m. I got an email from Dr. Kwan saying, here is evaluation question. And then you can see that's a PDF attachment. So I open it up that includes a question, but here are the requirements that's from Dr. Kwan. And I have till like uh, 3.5 because I was Eastern time. So technically that's 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So I have 3.5 hours to complete. After I received that, I simply replied back to Dr. Kwan saying, I got it. I received it, so I'm going to work on it. And by the way, you're going to all um, be on Zoom. People are monitoring you taking the exam. No, I'm joking. Nobody will monitor you on <laughs> Zoom. You're just going to work by your own pace. So you can have um, your um, you know, computer um, with you, all the resources you have with you. So you have 3.5 hours to complete that. And then after that, doctor, I send my re response back to Dr. Kwan. So once you submit it to Dr. Kwan, just simply reply back to him and do not leave your computer until you receive this email confirmation saying he got your response. Um, so that's the process for the first morning part. So after that, I went to get some lunch, <laughs> but I was so shaky, like my hand, it was like shaking. I cannot even drive myself. So I have something heated up and just like eat it from directly from my fridge. And so that's something I, I learned is um, during lunch, get something, you know, microwavable or prep something the night before. So you, you don't feel like rushed to go somewhere to get lunch for yourself. Then after that, in the afternoon, before 1 p.m. Central time. So again, Central time. So you'll be um, 2 p.m. if you're Eastern time. This is the second email I received from Dr. Kwan. And I have the article, it's article critique at afternoon. So this is an article and here's a guidance for that question. So then I have till 5.30 uh, Eastern time to complete, still 3.5 hours. Same process is I complete that piece, um, writing that uh, article critique. I send my feedback to Dr. Kuang and I wait for his feedback. And then that time my, uh, my husband and I, we take my daughter, we actually went somewhere to eat dinner. So that's the whole day for day one. So how do I prepare for that day? Um, with courses, there are courses we took that help you to prepare. Um, so for my application, I actually got evaluation questions. So you may find a trend from all the um, guest speaker Dr. Bunk invited, you may find a trend for the application topic. So from, from my case, it's evaluation. And evaluation, we, um, I believe there's a course 560. Uh, they talk about evaluation model, the uh, Kirkpatrick four uh, levels of evaluation. So that's super helpful. So definitely refer back to that course. And also Kirkpatrick book, if you can borrow it, I think IU even have a copy of that, or you, know, you can just buy the book, like a used book, it's like a couple bucks 
or um, I don't think that's expensive for that book. For article critique, here the courses are helpful to me. I feel like I list them from the importance um, to what I found the most important to me. So R69, um, that course, I recall when I took that course, there are several article critique practice in that course. So what we do is, you know, we, we submit article critique as assignment to the, uh, to the faculty member, and then we look at each other's article critique. So I found that super helpful because exactly practice how to article critique. 7-Eleven, because it helps you to do knowledge claims and how do you find the weakness or strengths for each research article. So that's where I found super helpful. So definitely also refer back to 7-Eleven. Um, for Y520, Y611, those are more talk about the research method, right? So if you're looking at the article research, article um, research paper, some of some big por big portion for that article critique is your research method. Is it valid? Is it um, do they include the survey? Is the survey good to address what they are trying to study? So that's two courses I also found important. So the textbook, the reading resources, I would definitely refer back to those. So those are the courses I found important to me to prepare this qualifying exam. Um, here are some steps to prep the qualifying exam. So before I take the practice exam, I draft outline for both application and also article critique. You draft some names, you know, if it's application, you have to have the company or some name who is leading that, um, you know, like a project. Draft some names, company's name, so you don't have to think about it when you're writing your paper. So have those names handy in a post-it or writing in the paper and create a template. Um, I also link my IU library to Google account. I know there are so many ways for you to find article, but during that day with that tight frame, uh, time frame, I found what's helpful. It just, I Google Google Scholar and I just find the, you know, type like if we're looking at high flex model in higher education, I simply type high flex higher education. It will bring up all the resources. And if you link your IU account to that Google Scholar account, you can directly open that document and you can also do citation. It's not 100% accurate for the citation, but it's a good place for it to start. You don't have to even draft from your, you know, like a reference. So that's what I found helpful for that link IU library to your Google account. Again, take the practice exam. This one, I think it's really, really important. Among all of them, I think this one probably that the one that helped me understand time management better than anything else is I don't have enough time to make a perfect paper for the application or the research paper. You have to take the exam to understand the time is really tight for that 3.5 hours. And then based on the uh, practice exam, Dr. Bong will give you feedback. For example, I remember one feedback Dr. Bong gave to me is when I take the practice exam in the article critique, I did not reference any other article because I was like, oh, I simply just need to critique for this article. But then Dr. Bong said, you know, you need to reference something. You need to have an introduction showing you you have a good grasp for that field. So that's, I remember, okay, so for in for article critique, you have to have some like reference from other articles. Not a lot, but at least you need some, um, you know, reading some other articles. So take that practice exam get Dr. Spunk's feedback. Then based on that feedback, revise your outline and template. Um, then I draft a plan for each section. So the plan, this is what I was saying, is example for that evaluation plan. I list how many minutes I should spend on each sections. So for example, if I'm doing high, high flex in higher education, right, I will research for 10 minutes, that's my timeline. With that 10 minutes, I will, uh, I will write a summary, but I only give myself like 30 minutes to do that. So this is my timeline for that. Not saying I directly follow this timeline, but it kind of helped me moving. So I know where I should pause and then start working on the next piece. Um, so this is my, my draft for my evaluation plan for that 3.5 hours. But of course you may have your own um, you know, template and schedule, feel free to, you know, write your own plan. So that's my evaluation plan. And this is my article critique. So I gave myself an hour to um, read article. Um, I actually have a printer in my home. I do not like to directly annotate on my computer. So I print article and I start writing on the strengths and limitation for that article. 
And then this is my timeline for each of that section. I spent how long I uh, spent roughly that time for that section. Um, so that's my timeline. Other preparation is, of course, you have to take the two days off. But you know, for that, if you need more days off, definitely take it off because you probably have to the day before, if you want to make some arrangements or something in your house, set up the printer or set up your table, definitely take more days off for that week. Um, if you have kids or, you know, like uh, other people you have to take care of, make arrangements for them. So you have those two days, you know, dedicated to this exam. Uh, find a comfy place to write at your house. So what I found, I have my table, but what I like is actually use my dining table. I removed everything else for my dining table. Nobody used that dining table for that two days. So I have my like a printed outlines, everything is there. And I put like posted on each part. So I have like really large dining table that's dedica dedicated to me for that two days. Um, also, I have a printer. Like I said, I like to directly write on a piece of paper rather than read it directly online and mark it in different color. Um, have an internet backup. This one didn't happen to me, but I did have a backup. So I opened the hotspot on my cell phone. I tested just in case if the internet doesn't go well on that day. Um, and again, I have something microwavable for lunch because after I finished the 3.5 hours, my hand was shaking. I, I can't even drive. But at night, I feel much better because I know it's the end of the day. So um, so then we were able to drive somewhere. Not, I'm not driving. My husband drove, drove us to somewhere. So that's the part one for day one. Any questions so far for day one before I jump to day two? Okay. For day two, the qual um, it's a presentation, but also you have to write 4,000 uh, words for that presentation. So you have two parts. One is you have to submit that um, 4,000 words to your advisor, to your committee, actually to your committee. So I believe there's a deadline. Um, in my case, that was like maybe two weeks or three weeks before the day to call exam. Um, so that date, I believe, should be communicated with you. Um, then you will be communicating with your advisor on the topic. So I recall when I start R6795, I have three topics in my head. I was like, I don't know which one to choose. They all sound interesting to me. But I eventually I narrowed down to one topic and I think it's more doable. And uh, I use that topic for my uh, dissertation topic. So definitely this day two topic should be uh, related to your dissertation. Um, also communicate your time zone with Dr. Kwan and he will probably, if you're Eastern time, he probably schedule more in the early. If you're in the central time, probably during the middle of the day, if you're the uh, West Coast, that's more towards the end of the day. Um, this one actually got a, a, a tip from uh, Alice. Um, last year she presented uh, she, how she prepared for calls. She recommended schedule a session with an IU librarian. And I found it's helpful is you just simply go to um, IU School, School of Ed library, and then you schedule a session, talk about your plan, how you want to tackle this you know, topic. And they may give you some reference um, topic. They will suggest some like a list of list, uh, readings for you and how you find those articles. Like again, the previous um, one I said, you have to link a Google Scholar to your, um, to your IU account. That is just for the 3.5. But with more time, I highly recommended to meet with the IU librarian to find more comprehensive reading list. They may show you some like uh, tips on how to get the most updated research from that area. And then just keep reading and writing. Um, so you will have like two or three weeks to draft your PowerPoint. So I believe it's 15 or 10 minutes, so either 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Dr. Bong probably can later comment on that. Um, then, um, of course, practice. Make sure your um, speech following that timeline and practice. Um, when I mentioned keep reading and writing, that part actually I was interviewing for my new job. I wrote a bunch of my stuff on the airplane trying to drive to doing my um, interview. So I was in my hotel writing my paper. I was on the airplane writing my paper. I even purchased like a um, internet membership on the airplane because it just like that's where I kind of I feel like I get most of my part down. I have my structure there, but I wrote a big portion when I doing my job interview. 
Um, so that's the day two. Any questions on the day two part? Okay, so I want to share a quote. Actually, um, it's from Dr. Bunk's um, calendar. It's actually just today. Life typically feel easy when he heading downhills, but it's the uphill challenge that are most are most often best remembered. So I think this definitely describe our experience of going through this qual exam preparation. It's we're definitely going uphill. It's we're challenging ourselves, and this memory definitely is. Um, you you will keep this memory for a long time how you prepare for this process. So that's my portion. Thanks, you. Uh, I just want to point out that time to present in any fashion, whether it's a dissertation defense, whether it's a qualifying exam, whether it's comprehensive, it all depends. It depends on the mood of your advisors and what they feel like listening to that day. And, you know, actually, I've seen it change. I've been on 125 dissertation defenses. I, I don't. I don't think any one of them have had start off the same way. You know, they they're all different, and and you know, it, it depends kind of who's on the committee, what their expectations, and how much time you get. If I go over to language ed, they go a half hour, and it's no problem. I come to if I have Dr. Regaluth and most famous guy in IST, it's 15 minutes. That's it. You know, so. If, if it's me, it might be, I say 15, I say 20 to 25, and then I let them go longer. So really, really just talk to your advisor. Your advisor normally will determine that kind of side of things. Um, let's see what else. Uh, practice exams. I've put the practice exams up. I think they work. You got to let me know if they do work. Um, in terms of feedback, again, if you don't get them done right away, I can give you feedback now, but later on the semester gets more difficult. I know some of you turned in your assignment number one. I have not looked at them yet. We've got dossier two this week for EDD students, and I've been reading files instead. So it's just this time we got someone, we got someone, two people interviewing for a job in IST this in the coming week. So it's kind of hectic right now. So if it's really hectic, I might not grade them right away. I I, I barely got sleep last night. Let's put it that way. So um and Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick is a famous model. He came back from the Korean War and then wrote his dissertation on this evaluation model that he had one idea and he became an international celebrity. And when he passed away, his sons took on the model. And I, one of his sons sat on a table with me in Singapore, of all places, about six or seven years ago. I had a chance to chat with him. His house, the original Kirkpatrick's house, is literally two miles from where I grew up. <laughs> he, he's he's from the west side of Milwaukee, just like I am. So it's kind of interesting. There's a few famous people in the field of distance learning who grew up also in that same area, like two miles from my house. So I, it's kind of weird. If I was a little kid walking a couple miles from my house, I would have run into these people, you know. So you uh, mentioned all these P words. She had she had a planning, practice, and preparation. The keywords. Then she had technology P words. Have your phone ready in case your internet goes because you can hotspot your phone. Make sure your printer's working and make sure your hands are not too shaky when you access the printer and open paper drivers and all. And then your PowerPoint slides. So a lot of P words, you uh, um, <laughs> and I even uh, didn't I, realize that. Thanks for the nice summary. <laughs> and as you know, my next book is going to be called Peeing Through the Pandemic. Plotting, pondering, and persevering, and all these other P words like podcasting, presenting, and praying, and other P words. Um, thank you, Yua. Anyone have a comment on Yua's or a question? I think Yua did a really good job. <laughs> so, Mangwan, thank you. Very comprehensive and practical suggestions. Mangwan, do you have? Um, your dissertation proposal advice that you sure, want to give. Sure, sure. Um, and I think we want to leave some time for breakout exactly. rooms. So yeah. um, I will try to make my part quick. Um, I definitely think EDD students want to concur the exam first. <laughs> um, so this part will be after the exam, what you will focus on. Um, earlier, I introduced this as the topic of my dissertation. Um, so this is the, exactly the same. Um, PowerPoint Can you that up for a second. You'll notice that it's kind of complex. 
Mm. <laughs> it's one of the more complex titles. Now, it's it's normal so, somewhat to have a complex dissertation title. Yep. Um, What's not and- normal about Hmong Wans is I don't think we had any changes to your dissertation proposal that you had to make. I think we passed you without Mm, you Any did. <laughs> you did give me some some. A couple. Um, I gave you feedback all the time, but I couple, think you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Doctor Daniel Hiki gave me more. Right. Oh, that's right. right. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But but Wang yeah. Wan did a wonderful job defending her proposal. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you, Doctor Bunk. Yeah. So as Doctor Bunk said, this um is a relatively complex title. So I dissect my topic into three constructs. Um, so um, SAS, social network sites for learning in higher ed. Um, the second one, learning engagement and scaffolding. So this is also how I conducted my literature review. So I conducted literature review under each construct. And here on the PowerPoint, you can say I dedicate uh, a few slides for the first SNS being used in higher ed for learning. Um, and I have a few slides for learning engagement. This is my second construct. And here I have this Berkeley and Majors dimensions of the engagement, um, double helix model. Um, so I try to um, analyze and describe learning engagements in two simple aspects, motivation and active learning. Um, so one is more from the emotional side and the other one is more from the cognitive side. And um, how to measure engagement in a social learning environment. And this is the third construct. So it's about uh, scaffolding strategies, but all this tie into my study context. Um, so in the social network site environment, um, I studied several um, articles and both based on this literature, I come up with a table, different strategies being used in this context uh, in social uh, network environment and the providers, um, timing of these strategies and also types. So put them into types. And this table is very helpful because it's laid the foundation for my um, data collection and data analysis. My faculty interview questions were created based on uh, these strategies and types of um, scaffolding strategies. And then later on, when I do uh, the data analysis, um, I also based on this table, uh, especially like types, to code um, the faculty interviews and my CN course site observation. Okay, so uh, the second part of my presentation, so I stated the significance um, of my study and the research questions. Research questions, I have four. So these are the research questions. Um, and the third part is the study design. So I took a mixed method approach. Um, so I talked about for each research question, um, what data I'm going to collect. Um, I have the detailed idea, what data I'm going to collect, and also the procedure to collect this data. So I took a three-step approach. Um, I have my colleagues, um, they're working on the technical side of the course networking platform to help me query courses operated uh, during this time frame. Uh, it's about two years. And then I sort these courses based on monthly average post, number of posts. And then based on that, so I selected 12 faculty members to interview. Um, I also op observed each of these 12 courses and conducted social network analysis on these 12 courses. Um, I conducted semi-structured faculty interviews with these 12 faculty members. And I also asked each of them to bring a artifact, like syllabus or assignments or um, any instructions they put on the course networking site into the interview. And I anal analyzed um, their artifacts as another data source. Uh, data analysis method, um, you can see how I analyze quantitative data um, as an A, this is a specific data analysis method for my study and qualitative data. Yeah, so, um, and also I, at the end, I briefly mentioned how I'm going to tackle validity and credibility, took several approaches. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, dissertation proposal defense, uh, what I did there, the PowerPoint, 
And um, do I still have, have, if you can give me one minute, one to two minutes, uh, I come up with some tips for uh, tackling the dissertation proposal and actually for the entire EDD dissertation, I think you are all uh, curious about uh, the timeline, right? What, what I did um, each month from last year, last January to now. And I think one good part is this class is exactly in the same time frame as I went through. Um, I'm just one year ahead all of you. So very quickly, you can see my timeline. It may not be the best that fit into your schedule, um, but I think at least to give you some ideas. Um, last year in January, I decided on the topic. And then the tip here is consult with your advisors, formal students, your friends, uh, stakeholders to select a topic as early as possible. Just as you had mentioned earlier, you want to have a topic topic that you have um, interest in it, right? That can benefit uh, your work if you're an EDD student. And also it's something that's practical, uh, it's doable. And um, so I have this goal, I, and I actually, um, I eventually decide on the topic um, based on how long I can um, finish it. <laughs> so I set up a goal, I said, I want to finish it in a year and I pick a topic that, um, that helped me meet this goal. Um, the so February to March last year, I did the literature review. My suggestion is dissect your topic into two to three constructs and set up an appointment with the School of Ed librarians um, so that you can get to know the topic and uh, get their advice on what kind of a journal sources you can look into and good citation tools you'll be using. April, April, I um finished the study design part. Uh, I wrote the study design part. The suggestions I have here is when you work on this part, go as much detailed as you can. Um, design your data collection instruments if you can. Um, that's what I did. So back then, I even come up with my observation sheets. Um, I came up with my interview and survey questions. Um, and also, begin exploring data analysis tools. Here, I want to uh, give you a name. So check out this tool uh, called Envovo. I think it's called this way. Um, N-V-I-V-O, Envovo. I discovered this tool. And vivo, and vivo. I discovered this tool just like last month, and I really hope that I find it earlier. <laughs> uh, it's a really, really great tool for qualitative data analysis. And Dr. Bank, you mentioned next week, you may have someone come in here and introduce qualitative data analysis tools. Um, yeah, so um, join that session and see what good tools you will discover and begin get into it. Uh, and live um, ah, and <laughs> IU give all of us as free access. Um, so you can quickly go to um, IUWare and get your account and um, um, start exploring, try to use it. Um, so last year in May, uh, I put together my proposal and revised it several times based on Dr. Bunk's feedback. I um, get my IRB approval June to July. And because earlier I already um, put my thoughts into the details, so I already had um, you know the, 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 the detailed plan about my observation, interview questions, so I was able to pass the IRB quickly. IRB will require you to have detailed research design, and that's why I think sooner or later, you know, those will be needed. Try to get to that um, as early as you can. It will be helpful. Um, so last July, I defended my proposal. Um, and I got some feedback, I made some revisions. By the end of July, I totally passed my uh, dissertation proposal. And uh, so my tips here is, if you are going to defend your proposal in the summer, try to schedule it um, earlier because faculty members, they have um, busy schedule, different schedules, in the, especially in the summer. Um, so set your spot earlier. Um, yeah, just very quickly, you can see what's going on after that. September and December, I spend the time on data collection. Since I did 12 faculty member interviews, that took 
took um, uh, quite a long time. Um, if I look back, I see you may be able to reduce some time here. And actually, my work got really busy last August. So I um, I kind of took a took a break then. I see if I get started earlier, you know, I schedule those faculty interviews earlier, that probably can push me to get data collection done earlier. Um, so December and January, um, I did all of the data analysis. I still have a little part left, um, trying to wrap around with my qualitative data analysis, um, see what themes will, will um, well, I will settle, settle on. So um, this is the data analysis part. And my plan in February, I'm going to revise my uh, study method part and write out findings. And in March, <laughs> um, writing the, the discussion part um, and hopefully in April I can defend, but at least I hope in April I can send my first draft to Dr. Bunk. <laughs> graduation, let's see, I really hope I can participate in the uh, May's graduation ceremony, but um, that's a question to Dr. Bunk and Shuya. I don't know whether PhD student could walk first <laughs> and then continue making some revisions. Um, yeah, and before the final so, dissertation defense. Can you, before we go to Shuya, can you go to your slide four and five? If you could call your slides back up. I Why wanted to comment on the Avivo tool. I, I got a recommendation of that when I was uh, doing research during the mm. doctoral program. And um, I really wanted to use that, but we don't have the ex easy access then at that time. So I'm really glad. glad now you can. can. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And I'm not sure. Uh, Karen's coming from University of Houston. I, don't, I, I assume you have in vivo down there, Karen. Um, yeah, yes, we do. And, uh, and we have access through the college. Right. That's what mm -hmm. the, I, I thought you did. You have your slides, Mengwan. Can you show oh. slides four and five? Oh, I see you were asking me. <laughs> I thought that was true. Yeah. Okay. Slides uh, back to PowerPoint four and five, right? Yep. So this was the insight that she had that enabled her dissertation to take place. Without this insight, she didn't have a dissertation. So I just want to point out every dissertation has some creative insight somewhere where you find gaps you find a new way to look at the data, you find some unique trends that might be happening that you can, no one else has been researching or looked at in, in a particular way. And you uh, found something that was not only that, but it was something that was understandable uh, to her committee and, and, and convincible. She was able to convince us that her dissertation was important from this slide. You want to explain what this slide is? Mm. So I came up with this graph um, after the liter uh, literature re reveal on um, how social networking sites are being used for learning in higher education. I think, you know, I'm a visual person and I try to make my dissertation, my proposal, um, you know, more understandable to others, to the audience. So I come up with this um, four quadrant graph um, and I plug these articles I read into this graph um, and you can see I have um, the 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 y um, axis is um, academic social networking sites and here this is a general SNS right on the left the the x axis the left has students self-directed learning and on the right more instructor guided learning um so you can w w i found a lot of uh, studies in this quadrant instructor guided um use of general social networking sites like facebook and twitter use these type we of sites for, yeah yeah for, <laughs> for, for, for learning. yeah yeah um fewer studies in this quadrant which is um where i'm going to study but which is i where I, course I, networking is in yes. effect yeah, because course networking is the academic social networking site. And I'm interested in instructor guidance and support to students. Um, yeah, so I find the gap. Um, but this quadrant really give us a lot of ideas, you know, in terms of existing faculty practices, you know, student, um, the impact of, of using social networking platforms for teaching and learning. Um, yeah, so um, this slide 
uh, I'm stating I drew ideas from this quadrant for the quadrant of my study. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, that one too. Yeah. You know, yep. right there, stop there and explain that too. Yeah, so um, I picked the four articles from this quadrant, instructor guided using general SNS for teaching and learning. And um, I have this, you can see the, the kind of the um, um, getting higher and higher, right? Um, it's indicating the impact on student learning. So with no instructor participation um, and gradually with more instructor involvement and guidance and high quality guidance, the student learning outcomes and then the engagement going higher. Um, so I try to use this graph to indicate stop, how important. Stop, stop there. Yeah. So if, you, if you're interested in this topic, um, Ray Junko, the third one, is someone who studied students in college settings using Twitter and Facebook and their impact on grades and the impact on, on uh, test scores and on retention and all this stuff. Really interesting stuff. Uh, he did a series of studies and he was a guest in one of my other classes a decade ago, probably around 2013 or 2012. Uh, he came in as a guest. Um, so that's an important topic. And if you've taken my emerging technologies course, I get into it for a week in there. I don't, what's the next slide? I think we should probably end because Shui has got yeah. to present here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, um, I said it's the impact on learning. Yeah. yeah. Any comments for Meng Wan or questions? So a couple of things I want to mention, you, you can, at Indiana University, you, once you pass your qualifying exams, you can graduate in, in I've had many students who went through graduation and they've still not defended their dissertation a decade later. So I caution against doing, in, if you're too far out, I've had parents come from Japan and come from Korea and get, you know, we all shake their hands and everyone bows and genuflex and yet they didn't finish. And mm -hmm. I, you know, but you can, you can go through, uh, you know, no problem. Uh, in terms of, um, Tina, in terms of practice quals in Canvas, I realized, so I, what I did is cut and cut and paste the practice from last semester to this semester. I didn't change the dates, so they might not be active and live till I change the dates. So I thank you for catching that, Tina. I got the chat message. And finally, you are and Meng Wan, can I get your slides and post them to Dropbox for everybody um, to look at later? Definitely. So you guys send me those. I don't know if Shuya has slides as well. But if you do, Shuya, you have three minutes to present those slides or about four. Okay. Sorry, Shuya. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I was really, uh, the peer pressure is pretty <laughs> big here. Both Shuya and Mong Yuan have pre are so well prepared. And I actually, I haven't prepared any additional slides. I just uh, came up with some talking points. <laughs> Perfect. <here. laughs> um, uh, this one quick comment to the uh, graduation. Um, so I actually uh, attended the graduation ceremony in May of 2018, and I actually defended in the winter of 2018, and I have finished all the revision in uh, a few months uh, later than that That's in 2019. So <laughs> you, can, you can join the ceremony early. Thank you. Thank you, Shia, for sharing your experience. Um, so I uh, I was meant to talk ab um, about uh, my uh, dissertation defense experience and uh, um, some of my takeaways. Um, so maybe I'll start with some gen general general um, uh, thoughts I have. Um, the biggest one, um, which is uh, which I got from Dr. Bank, is. Um, to get it done and don't stress to be perfect. <laughs> so the dissertation um, will be a, a, not at any point, will be a starting point for whatever you're going to do um, in academia or in industry after you, you, are, after you graduate, you will, you, you will be able to do a lot more research projects or other um, 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 design projects later on. So on to you, I think, um, just to find something doable and uh, good enough to show your um, achievements in the program, um, but also doable. So I, I think one of the most um, um, important factor that's in <clears throat> impacting the um, scope of uh, the project, the research project is um, access to data sources. Um, so, um, 
uh, Dr. Bong, you probably remember, I started with uh, the platform called Live Mocha, but uh, when I was writing the problem, <laughs> the, the website got um, acquired by uh, Rosetta Stone and the le learning community online there is gone. So I had to switch um, a platform, which uh, I had no clue at the time, but uh, Dr. Bong connected me to um, uh, Brian, um, Todd Brian uh, at Dickinson University, uh, who developed the Mixer website to um, get my <laughs> dissertation done. And um, so a lot of work already have gone into uh, the place um, before you do the defense. So you have done the proposal, got feedback on the proposal and uh, started your data collection and analysis and uh, wrote the draft of your paper already. And uh, before the dissertation, you probably will already get feedback from your uh, dissertation chair, a uh, committee chair. So um, uh, for me, uh, to my understanding, the de defense is um, more like a, a celebration <laughs> and a chance for people to get together. Uh, because at that time, I was already um, not on campus. Um, when I'm writing after I passed the call, uh, proposal defense. So it's a chance for me to go back to campus, meet all faculty and friends there, and also prepare some refreshments <laughs> for everyone to um, create a, um, a good mood for the defense. Um, uh, so we sit together, go through the uh, study that I have done. Um, I prepared the presentation and I was practicing for um, a few times before I go there. Uh, thinking it's going to be a very long presentation of, from beginning to end, but actually um, it became more conversational as uh, the committee members stopped me uh, in uh, different time points and asked me questions. So uh, the conversational atmosphere actually uh, makes me feel uh, a bit less nervous. <laughs> And, and um, you might also want to be prepared to uh, take some critiques on your study. Um, so um, to be um, um, emotionally prepared for that, that, that might be necessary too. Um, and uh, what's my last point? Uh, right, uh, and uh, I also find it very helpful to get a proofreading service for the final dissertation paper. That uh, I didn't think of that, but my uh, committee suggested that to me and um, having some um, um, online uh, proofreading service to go through the paper and uh, make it um, more professional and uh, finalized, uh, polished, and that, that, that's very helpful. Shuya, can I add one thing? Uh-huh. Oh. And, and, and not to embarrass you, Shuya, but yeah. she had some tough questions at, at a couple of points, even though it was a conversation. And, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't necessarily an easy dissertation to defend, um, you know. So uh, one caution, I think, after coming away from Shuya's dissertation is she, her minor was language education, and she had two members from language education, who's one mm -hmm. of them is now an IST member, but back then I think she was, right? You had two... Uh, yeah. language ed people yes you know i would caution against having two people from your minor um even though you might find it to be a strength and be important because you're doing a dissertation in your major and they can pull you they they are looking at it. if they get two people on the committee they start pulling you in the direction of your minor area and start evaluating and judging you based on your minor adding terminology and all sorts of things which is is good but with one person they won't necessarily do that with two people they can start ganging up a little bit on you um to include such things and so I, at some point when i at, at your defense i was kind of feeling like maybe we shouldn't have had two people from your minor area let's put it that way do you have any reactions to that Shuya? uh yeah it was a little <clears throat> I was finding some of the feedback a little bit um, hard to address. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad that uh, my chair, uh, Dr. Bonk, was there to uh, help uh, got, like direct the conversation and <laughs> um, find the focus and uh, help me uh, filter through some of the feedback. I got without there. without throwing water bottles at the other faculty members, <laughs> <laughs> which I wanted to do at times, or water balloons. 
Um, <laughs> you know, I was I was getting a little nervous for Shuya because they, they were pretty tough at at one point, and then all of a sudden it eased up. Once she once we once we addressed a couple of things, then went back to a conversation. But there, there sometimes is a point, and uh, not in every dissertation, but in many of them, where you you kind of like. You, they're asking one question after another, which is difficult. And um, you try and, you know, as I said last week, you try and look at the person who's asking you that question and pan to everybody in the room and then come back to that person and respond to them and try and do the best job that you can, you know, um, without looking at your notes too much, anyhow, maybe a little bit looking at your notes, without looking back at your dissertation or whatever. You know, you make your best attempt. And if you do that, well, you know, if you, if you've practiced enough, you'll have a, a, a repertoire of answers that you can give. So I really recommend, like I said last week, practicing with other friends, the, your delivery and the Q&A with your advisor. In fact, you can do it. I, 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 probably more than half of people dissertating do a dry run with myself um, and get some feedback that way. But again, because I'm, I, I've been in that department helping on many dissertations, but I'm not a member of it. And so I didn't anticipate some of the questions that they were going to ask. Um, and so, um, but and, and also I can say that there can be one person on your committee who can be more picky than everyone else. <laughs> that happens too. Um, but get your advice from your advisor on who to get. Questions for Yua, Shuya, or Mangwan. We'll go to breakout groups for about 15 minutes and then come back. I just want to get us a chance. And when we come back, I'm going to hopeful that you, uh, Shuya and Mangwan can show us a baby and put them on the camera. Uh, I want to see at least one, uh, three baby girls out of five. Um, <laughs> if we, if they're available. Going to gather them. <laughs> unless you've sold them to the circus or something <laughs> or working from the library right now. Um, so I'm going to try and create breakout rooms to see if it's possible. Let's see, breakout rooms. I'm going to create two breakout rooms and manually create them. And in breakout group number one, I'm going to put Karen, Heijan, uh, Shuya, and myself. And am I missing any other PhD person? So Karen, Heijan, Shuya, who else? Uh, Tofik. Huh. And... Then the other group will have Mangwan, Paula, Tina, and Yua. So let's go to group two. Mangwan, Paula, Sume, Tina, and Yua. And then I'll join group one. And just, just, you know, any questions you have, any advice that they have, um, you know, so, um, so soon may you'll be the instructor in charge of room two. I'll be instructor in charge of room one. And we'll, I'll just pull us back when I feel like it's time, maybe 15 minutes from now, maybe 20 minutes. If it's still going, right, 25, but probably 15 minutes of chat. And then we'll back, come back and, and talk about what you discussed. It's just an open-ended conversation, really. There's no structure to it. Um, let me open all rooms and um, you can join the rooms. Oh, and I should pa I'll pause the recording. and just say we had a I think we had a good discussion in our room hey Jean what do you think now that you now that you're eating <laughs> I can call on you <laughs> uh, Karen what'd you think was that yeah, useful? that was a pretty informative um, discussion yes um, it was truly helpful mm -hmm. Karen back to you you were gonna I cut you off no, no, no. I was just saying that it was uh, informative. Um, it kind of helped help me um, a good bit. Just rethinking what my topics are, what my topic mm. is, and mm. seeing how I can, you know, dig deeper into it. Actually, so yeah. What your topic is, not what your topic is, but your topic. Sorry, well, topic. topic I... is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right, Tina. How how did it go in your room? I think it was very helpful. Um, I feel a little bit more focused. I told them I feel a little like all over the place. Um, uh, yeah, I feel a little better now. Hey, John. Yeah, they also very helpful and informative, especially how to recruit participants. 
there are different mm -hmm. ways and solutions. Yeah, it was very helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a big topic. If anyone has suggestions for recruitment, <laughs> anyone have a, a suggestion for recruitments of getting how to get your subjects? We, we came up with seven different ways. So we probably mentioned a couple of thinking of, but um, anyone want to suggest one? I, it, it's just one is money. Yeah. Give. <laughs> a free flight to Korea, <laughs> <laughs> tour, yeah, all that. A weekend in Airbnb <laughs> in the mountains. Uh, Paula, what do you think? It was an informative session. I, I got to, to learn more about the evaluation plan process and, you know, make me think about what resources I need to add as well. So it was good to hear from the experiences of others. Sune? Yeah, there was, you know, actually I shared some experience and then I realized that we went through the really similar, you know, experience and then we came up with uh, some good, you know, advice for students. That's because we went through the same thing and then we got the really good result. So for example, create a tem template, right? And the work with other people, right? To review the, our, you know, working, you know, document that's because sometimes we wrote the document and then we are not sure if it's good or not right and then they recommended to use the practical exam before you know earlier and then you know see the result actually this time is different that's because mine actually i did it there was nothing no <laughs> feedback so just i went you know through everything but this time actually you 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 know, share that one, you know, actually gave us some feedback and then it was really helpful. So we recommended to take a practice earlier and then make sure and then maybe made some, you know, timeline for, you know, tasks. You know? So usually we talked about the qualifying exam and after that, you know, some advice about the IRB. And then actually we have one question about the IRB. So actually we are working on two different two, you know, university. At that time, we have to get an IRB from both of them or just two from Yeah, so it depends on your institution. If you're if you're working for a community college like Karen is, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Karen, does it require an IRB? Does it does yes, it does. So she has to do two. It's it's your the, the where you're getting your paycheck from, if it requires it, then you will need to, because mm -hmm. IU is going to definitely require it, or University of Houston is mm -hmm. probably going to require it to cover themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's the question is whether your um, employ place of employment will or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine. It's above 50 50, you know. Some do, and some have a formalized process, but some are small organizations that don't have a, if it's, the larger the organization, the more likely they're going to require an IRB. You are or Meng Wan, any final comments? Just take the practice exam. <laughs> <laughs> if you're yeah. an EDD student, I, I think that's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? That actually, you know, the break time is really good. That's because before taking the qualifying exam, I felt really isolated. That's because there is nobody. And then I don't know how to prepare for the qualifying exam, but there was some, you know, group session and then maybe give more information from the test taker, right? Former test taker. So it was really helpful and they feel better anyway. That's because those people went through the same, you know, you know, process that I will do that, right? So maybe hopefully Dr. Monk will provide this one. Same thing, you know, next year mm -hmm. and next year, mm -hmm. hopefully. So it will mm -hmm. be yeah. helpful, I think. Meng Wan? Uh, two things. Take one step at a time. I think look back last year at this time. I had nothing and I was very stressed. Um, but gradually you will figure things out. Um, and number two, ask Dr. Bunk for resources. <laughs> he has a lot of good resources, right, Dr. Bunk? <laughs> um, I find it really helpful um, 
Dr. Bank shared a folder with some formal students' um, dissertation proposals, their PowerPoints, um, their um, um, final dissertation. I looked into those, got a lot of good ideas, yeah, because I had no previous experience on this, and um, and other people's they have uh, walked through this process, uh, look at their what they get done um, was very helpful. I agree with that. That a strength that that in this class is that Dropbox having those dissertation proposals, prospectuses, and final dissertations. Mm. And also having examples of the tasks and all these other, the examples are always helpful for people, yep. you know. I the readings, the readings in this class, to be honest, you know, they're, they're probably really great readings, but this is not necessarily a class you're gonna to wanna to read all that research stuff. You wanna read what fits your study, you know. And so if the right articles in there that fits your site, then it's great. But you may not find in all those readings, you may not find the article that impacts your dissertation. But those examples, you will probably find an example that will be close to your dissertation. I would say that, that that's more likely um, to happen. And then those writing articles at the end, those short ones, I'm still adding to them. I think those are kind of, you know, that, that's kind of a strength in here too, I think in some ways. Um, Shuya, anything you want to fi a final thought? Um, uh, one one thing about the um, writing process, data collection and writing process, it's it's gonna be a long <laughs> journey, and uh, being away from campus, um, doing that alone, uh, it's a little bit hard to get through through. So um, I I haven't tried it myself, but I saw other uh, peers uh, at IST um, like joining some uh, writing groups. They meet regularly together or just uh, mm -hmm. have session together to sit and quietly write on their own um, and maybe um, um, get feedback from peers and faculty member. And along the way, um, I think that will help a lot. So how else can you get done? You could have uh, someone you work with. So I co-dissertated with Tom Reynolds and he did a dissertation with college students in computers and writing with our keystroke mapping and prompting system. And I worked with sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And we talked to each other in his office at night and figured out the writing model that we would create. So having one or two colleagues is another, is one way. And every Friday afternoon in Wisconsin, the really fun people go over to the union because the union's on a lake with a lot of beer being served. And then we could chat about the research that we did during the week and reflect. We did, it's a reflection at the, every Friday we'd meet on a late Friday afternoon. Uh, and I've continued that tradition in meeting my students at Lenny's on late Friday afternoon, as some of you know, uh, when I can. <laughs> and so one way is to have a partner. Two, you can have your advisor contact you once a month, or you can have a chat conversation with an advisor. Three, you can create a blog. And I've seen some students do this. They have a social media blog. So then they have a peer support group. There are different blogs out there, and I'm blanking on a couple of them's name. So there's there's websites called um, I've i done this Joe's goals uh, forty three things is it forty three things or something like that that's the one that I've seen people post then they post the their goals in there and then they they have a whole global support network out there uh, helping them reach their goals now you do you might do it in a more localized social network such as your Facebook groups or your WeChat groups or Kakao Talk or something on our line or whatever you use. Uh, but that's another way in which you can uh, get things structured. Another uh, idea is to have your dissertation lead to a publication early, and like your literature review might get submitted. In Finland, I think the University of Houston are playing around with this too now, uh, and many Scandinavian countries have this, where the students do not pass their dissertation unless they have three publications or at least articles submitted for publication. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, people might submit part of chapter two as maybe a literature review or systemic re systematic review of the research. By having those benchmarks of having a paper submitted by a certain time, that's that will help you to not procrastinate too much. Uh, but there are there are other ways in which to get you know, beyond, you know, but having those due dates of having a conference paper due or uh, a special issue journal article, the special issues coming out on a certain date and you've committed to getting that um, and so forth. Um, any final comments before we take a short break in here?
You uh, do you want to make a final because you came after Bill arrived. Uh, you were uh, Bill arrived after you spoke. You want to say any final advice for Bill since Bill's in here now? You uh, um, I um, I, I I just think just enjoy the journey. I feel like I took a long pause for my journey, but now I'm picking it up. Um, it's going to be memorable and you're not alone we have a you know good connections over here all the professors are here wonderful the exam is not trying to you know it's trying to help you prepare for your dissertation um so like the day two exam i found it super helpful is i use a semester to draft my things and it's like we have a good class we have a good professor so you're not alone in this journey so just enjoy the journey while you're you know working on your dissertation and you can have a planner, you can have an online digital timeline of your, you know, your goals. All these are guides for you. I have six, cal I have January, February, March, April, May, and June on the wall. I have six calendars on my wall, one of every different month. And I can see and plan what I'm doing in each one of those months. Physical planners, not digital. To, you know, to really, if a digital one, you got to open up your computer and all this. Mm -hmm. No, it's right there in front of you. Or have, a, have the calendar on your refrigerator or on the garage door. Have it physical so you're aware, meta aware of it, and you build that in. So you need both digital aids and physical aids and mental aids. You need to think always about it. I want to thank Meng Wan and Yua and Shuya for coming in. Please give them a round of applause. You know, it's really, really nice to have three of you with us, back with us. It feels, can, can I be 13 years, 12, 12, 12 and a half years younger, please? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Bell was only in grade school back then, but okay, um, <laughs> I, I was not. Um, so uh, again, I wanna thank, thank you all for coming. I'm gonna pause the recording here at this point and just um, wave before I pause the recording. So. You might be asking, well, how did I get my samples? I did a series of MOOC studies with, with Mena Ju and Anissa Sari and other people. And Mena and Anissa captured MOOC instructor names by going to the platforms of Coursera and edX and other entities and found the instructor names and emails. And it was as simple as that. Now, it took a lot of their time. It took a lot of effort, took a lot of their work. Uh, to do that, but um, they were great champions for that for that project, and so um, I benefited. They benefited from having a database that no one else had. We we got donated 800 instructor names from someone else who was going to do research on MOOC instructors. He gave them to us. Um, his name is George Valencianos, and George gave us his names, and then. Um, we expanded on his list to get 3,000, over 3,000. Then we did studies on MOOC instructor motivation, um, instructional design, cultural sensitivity, personalization, professional development, you know, and a whole series of things that we, uh, challenges and so forth. And then we asked a couple of them, you know, could you embed our link in your MOOC to get student side? So some of them embedded our link to the survey on the on their in their MOOC, so we got the student data. So that's a couple of different ways. With my wiki book research, which Karen and I, I, I did some with your advisor, um, with Dr. Lee, uh, we asked Wikipedia itself and Wiki, that's part of the Wikimedia headquarters, if they could could send the survey out to all Wikibookians, people who are creating Wiki books, and they said sure. So they. We got that, you know, we could, you can mine different databases so you can get access to the names and emails. So if you can find a website with people's names and emails, then you can mine that and 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 get access to it. Um, so sometimes it just takes a little thinking about where can you get access. In our study of MIT, and, and, and also Dr. Lee and I studied M MIT open courseware, we sent our survey out to the MIT OpenCourseWare executive and they embedded our link in their newsletter that went out to 180,000 people. 
at the in, in one little blurb within their digital newsletter had a, a note that we were conducting a study or my team was conducting a study and blah, blah, blah. And we had 800 people respond to that survey. And this, you know, it's not a, a large percentage, but it's enough to do our the research that we were conducting. I also taught a MOOC 10 years ago and was able to embed a link within the MOOC or tell all the participants, there were 4,000 participants of the MOOC that I had. Um, I did the first MOOC for Blackboard and Blackboard sent out an email to people who had enrolled in my MOOC. So forming partnerships, in this case, I formed a partnership with Wikipedia. I formed a partnership with MIT Open, Cor MIT Open Courseware people, formed a partnership with Blackboard. Those are ways in which one can get a sample. Uh, there are other studies that I've conducted recently. I'm trying to think of some of the other. So I'm currently studying South American MOOCs. My grad student found the emails of instructors in South America, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, Argentina, and found uh, their email addresses. And not right today, this week, we are, well, was two days ago, we interviewed our first subject in that. We're surveying them right now. So that's another study. And she did the same with tango dancers. We're studying tango dancers self-directed learning during the pandemic. So in different ways, it, with my Nepal study of students in Nepal learning from MOOCs, we had a teacher who provided the names to, of students to interview who, who volunteered and teachers to interview. So it came through a, a leader. So sometimes a leader within the, a group can help you get access. I'm thinking about doing a study of Afghan women in Bangladesh now, who um, I, Mena and I did a, 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 a presentation to last month. Uh, they were in the, in the Inside Higher Ed today, had an article about these women in Bangladesh and other parts of the world who had escaped before the Taliban. And I'm thinking that might be interesting to do a study on access and, you know, kind of related to diversity, equity, and inclusion with uh, educating these young female leaders in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we've had young leaders from Afghanistan come to IU for one project, and I really enjoyed having them in my class. So I, I think it'd be a kind of an interesting project. So sometimes you get interested in things, um, Karen, that you just glance upon. Like today, I was reading the Inside Higher Ed, and it one and one made two. We I, I have access. I know someone there. They're going to be on my podcast show, in fact, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have presented to these young ladies or young female leaders in uh, who are in Bangladesh now, they're female leaders from Afghanistan. So just, you kind of have your antennas up a lot. Now, another thing I want to talk about briefly is how does one get a dissertation topic, <laughs> which I didn't promise I would talk about, but I think it's important. And um, maybe I need to create, soon maybe I need to create a top 10 list of how one gets um, access to data sa samples and how one comes up with a topic. But besides writing down on a slip of paper, you know, all the open gaps, another way to get a dissertation topic is just be part of a research team with your advisor and have your advisor suggest uh, a possible gap. That happens a lot, more so than I would hope, actually. That's not my number one way that I would recommend, but is probably the number way that most people get a dissertation topic is following the lead of their advisor. Others might be on a research team and see a gap that their advisor doesn't see. I'd rather see that happen than having the advisor suggest and hold their hold someone's hand and say, you should be doing this and then walking them all the way through it. Um, I, I'd prefer them to select self-select a gap or see an opening that hasn't been seen before and make a suggestion for what could be studied or analyzed. Another way that happens once in a great while is to analyze existing data. Now, there are two ways, existing data that you found or existing data that your advisor or someone on your committee has. They just never analyzed it. And lo and behold, you're here, you're interested in the topic, and there you do the analysis of existing data that had been, maybe it's a giant survey like at Indiana, we have the National Survey of Student Engagement. We have a center for it. They've collected this survey of student engagement on college campuses around the world and high schools now too, and community colleges, the Nessie and the Hesse and all this. And I had one student analyze 
that data been collected for decades in a new way that the the guy in charge, his name is George Koo, very famous guy, hadn't hadn't done. So so sometimes you're looking at an existing data set and just analyzing it in some way that hadn't been done or had new framing, a new lens, a new theoretical perspective on existing data. So, you know, times change, culture changes and society changes. And now there might be a new theory or theoretical approach to look at data that's maybe maybe five years old or 10 years old or maybe one year old or half year, whatever. So that's another way. Um, additional ways might be suggestions from others. You know, saying you might want to think about doing that, this X, Y, or Z. Uh, another way is to just create a small pilot study, which happens to a lot of people. We start off small and see what's out there, and you build it on it a little bit at a time, and eventually you have enough to do a dissertation on, on X, Y, or Z. A little bit of experimenting here and there, a little bit of tinkering here and there that might lead to a dissertation topic. What other ways have I seen uh, people get a dissertation topic? Um, sometimes uh, there is an area of research that um, a department or a uh, professor has been studying, um, and they have a whole a whole series of research that their advisees have done, and they tell their advisee, this is, these are the areas that have been looked at, and these are the areas that have not been looked at, and their advisee might pick out one. So for instance, we had professors who were interested in um, simulations and gaming here. And there was a particular simulation study is based on Ever Everett Rogers' research. And so all these students, like maybe 10 of them have targeted or attacked that this, I forget what the name of the simulation is, but uh, that particular simulation was instrumental in doing 10 different dissertations. So that was, that was kind of interesting. Maybe some with different age groups, for instance. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on what, what other things were done with that simulation or experimentation, but definitely with different age groups or familiarity with the simulation maybe gender comparisons, um, maybe learning style, I don't hate learning style, maybe those kind of comparisons and so forth. Other dissertations, often, especially EDDs, are doing dissertations based on the work setting and what's happening in the work environment. But I had um, a student um, who, um, I might bring back here in two weeks. I might bring, so Ramsey studied um, not one laptop per child. I had one student study a one laptop per child project. He was studying the, uh, what was it called? Where everyone, uh, BYOD, bring your own device, bring your own device. So he was studying bring your own device in Indiana and, and school systems that were creating curricula around bring your own device. So students that were bringing their own device. So he had to work with the state government. So some students work with the state government. I had a couple that I can think of right off the bat that worked with the Indiana State Department to come up with their dissertation studies. So sometimes an organization, some have worked with the, mil with the military. A couple of them, in fact, are our Coast Guard. We have a big Coast Guard contingent in our program, at least a couple people every year or two that come through and they have to you know, if they go beyond the master's for a dissertation, in fact, I just had one finish his a couple months back. Um, so they get their data from the, a military kind of setting. So really the, the settings that you're in, the data that's available, the instruments that um, are used, maybe your, your institution like ours is well known for the NESI and the HESI, National Survey of Student Engagement. Well, but you, at, at your institution or in Stanford soon, at your place, you might be known for something else that you might study. So, so that's the second thing that I want. So anyone want to comment on either of those before I go to the ways to say no? Was that helpful? Everyone's quiet. Paul, was that helpful? Yes. Yeah, Tina? <laughs> It was. Yeah. Yeah. Paul? It was, yeah. Thank you. 
So that's mm -hmm. something I've not thought about previously. And so these, what I'm going to try and do this semester is create some of these like 10 ways to get your sample or 10 ways to think about, you know, coming up with a dissertation topic. That might be a good thing to add into this class for the next time I teach it. So this is kind of a, okay. this is off the top of my head. I've not, I didn't plan to talk about either of those today. That just popped into my head. I, sh, you know, based on our breakout group that I think is important. So I hope you had a, a chance to, to read through the two handouts, the one on 20 ways to say no. You know, most of those ways are legitimate ways that I've used. You know, the, everyone is, most everyone is sick from time to time. Most everyone has had a computer crash from time to time. Um, most everyone has had times where they've had to attend to family duties or they've had to go back home and visit their parents because of, you know, some illness or some event, some celebration or something like that. Um, the, you know, family and personal matters come up. And so, you know, you have to be honest with people when they do happen. I've now got someone who sent me a, a paper to review for computers in education, which is a top journal or number two journal in the field. I've been so tired. I mean, just, I'm barely breathing. Getting, and I, I didn't say no. I put, I printed out the email. I put it on my printer so that if I do free up tomorrow, I could say yes. So sometimes you don't say no right away. Sometimes you don't say yes right away. Sometimes I send an email back to myself and so I don't make a decision, but the emails in my inbox to something I have to make a decision in a day or two. So I, I like to, I don't like to not open the email up, even when I know pretty much what it's going to say. I still, mm, except once in a while, I don't open the email up and I just let it lie there. But most of the time I open it up and if it's something I have to respond to and I don't want to respond right away, I just send it back to myself or, or, and, or I print out or both. You know, and that's a way not um, sometimes by the time you do respond, they've gotten someone. So you didn't say no in the in the interim, they've resolved the issue. Now, you don't want to let people lag too long, especially with this pandemic. You know, there's so much problems in getting people to review papers today. So if you're being asked to review a proposal for a conference or paper or whatever, you know, even though. I often will recommend other people. I'll do my I'll do my share too. So you don't want to do too many. So find out, make a rule of thumb of how much is too much for you. How many times, Heijong, will you have a peer say to you, could you could you come to my practice? I want your feedback, you know, then you probably want to be a good citizen and they'll give you feedback when you, but there's some times in which you have exams coming up or other things that you're going to have to say no to it. You know, and just say, this is, you know, if what you can say is if you can wait five days, I'd be happy to do it then. You know, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, if if you want to chat with me on the phone, here are the times, you know, I'll often say when people are you know, pressed, you know, I'll meet them at, at, in Zoom at nine o'clock or eight o'clock or 10 o'clock at night and just to get it resolved for them. And then I'm not interrupting my daytime, but I'm still helping them out. It might be. At a, at a sort of inconvenient time, but yet I'm helping them for that, for that inconvenient for them, not for me. I, I work late. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I, I try and find a middle ground. Oftentimes you don't have to do exactly what they're asking. Sometimes you can reshape it. And sometimes when people ask you to do a favor, one, one big thing that I found that saved me a lot of time was creating a list of people that I know in their emails and putting their bios and their pictures of other people in the field. So if you become known as a chemistry research, you know, whatever whatever expert in motivation and chemistry or whatever, authentic learning chemistry, whatever, you can find other people who might also be doing research in that area. So when you're asked to review a paper related to chemistry and authentic learning, Karen, you can then say no. And then they'll always, not always, they tend to have a box where you can put who do you recommend to review it? You know, I'm sorry you can't review the paper, but then you can put in the email names of other people and then you don't feel so guilty, you see? And mm -hmm. during the crunch, the, um, um, the pinnacle of e-learning and blended learning that about a decade ago, I was getting 
you know, a decade or two ago, all every day it seemed like I was getting invited to go to. There was a conference in Saudi today, in fact, which one of my former students is in Saudi uh, there and was trying to get me to come. Um, my podcast partner, Chris Didi, ended up going virtually. I didn't go. I, um, I would have gone virtually. So I just, I, you can't do everything that, you know, that lovely. It would have been lovely to go to Saudi again. It's been a while since I've been kidnapped. I'd like to go and get kidnapped again. Um, <laughs> I was almost kidnapped. They just tried to extort money out of me and I escaped to the tax, to the guy's window. But uh, you can, if anyone's interested, there's a blog post on that one I can send to you to read a humorous one. I had, 10 or 12 bad flights in a row where pilots couldn't find the runway, uh, the ice storm, the, the engine was stuck to the ground into the terminal. I had uh, flat tires on the runway. Uh, you know, they couldn't land the plane. Not only couldn't find the landing, couldn't land the plane. I've had 10, 10 or 12 in a row. <laughs> it was, Nat Saudi was one of those 10. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting blog post. Anyways, it, you know, it makes you, those events that happen in your life, we all have them. You have those scary moments, whether it's in a taxi cab. And I've had, you know, guys drive like crazy from from Abu Dhabi to Dubai at 180 kilometers an hour, which is basically 130 miles an hour mm. for an hour and just petrifying me, you know. And, um, you know, at that point you start saying, there's got to be a way to say no to all these things. And you do, so another thing you can do, mm -hmm. right? And another thing you can do, it's just mark in your planner, you know, just block it out. And so if someone asks you to do something in June and July, you can take a picture of this and say, those months I've allocated to spend June with my family and July writing my proposal or July writing chapter two and sending it to a journal. Uh, and, and therefore, if you've marked those off, I, 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 I'm sorry, I wish I could say yes. But once I say yes to something, then I have to say yes to everybody else. So I really apologize. And if after July, it's still an opportunity, let me know and I'll reconsider. Don't say you definitely would do it. Just say I'd reconsider. You see, these are ways to say no, but not really say no. And there's less guilt that way. Another way is to have your supervisor or advisor tell you, no, uh, Heijong, no, Sunmei, you cannot commit to another project right now. You have to finish the XYZ. You have to do what you said you were going to do. You're on too many committees as it is. You're on too many projects right now. Whatever reason, excuse that they give you, they gave you that excuse. And you have to use that excuse to, you know, to say no. It's, it's your advisor, your supervisor, your manager, your, you know, whomever it is, your dean, they told you what to say it's your duty to say that you know um and 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 just with a, with a little bit of apology just say that i you know these are the constraints i'm under i i you know in, in, in the future it will be different and and so forth so those are another way is to say if someone's asking you to do something and you've done stuff like that during the year just say i've committed to three or four or one or two of those already I wish if you had contacted me a week ago, I would say yes. But I've now I've just just yesterday committed to another one. And that happens all the time. Just be honest with them and say, you know, um, I cannot say no to this person. So I committed to theirs and I can't fit one more in right now. They'll understand. At least you thought about helping them out. You gave them a rationale for why you can't help them out. Um, what are some other ones on my list here? You actually can say, my energy tank is low right now. You know, you can just say, I have done X, Y, and Z during the past four or six months. You know, I have not taken a full day off actually in three years. And I, I tell okay. people that, you know, I tell people flat out when they send me something to do, I say, you know, I have not had a break in three years. Please, you know, I wish I could do it. But it's just one of those things. Now, I plan to take time off next month and visit my brother down in Florida. We'll see. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> and just drive around Florida going like a crazy man and visiting my old dean and my friends. And who knows? We'll see. Collect seashells. I'll teach this class from the beach in Florida next month. <laughs> Soon May's going to come join me. <laughs> She's, uh, no. uh, what else is on here? Sabbaticals. Now, 
sabbaticals don't, don't just happen in university settings. They happen in work settings too. My niece works for a company that does, um, that's like in the mid, like the Google for the Midwest does healthcare stuff. What the, Epic. Epic gives all employees a, a sabbatical every couple of years, sends them to other countries, you know? So you might have something like that at work that you can discuss or talk about. Uh, there are many other things in here. Um, so th some things to avoid, you know, a, a 20 minute survey, a half hour survey, 10 minute survey, 15 minutes, just, you know, do some, you don't have to do all every survey that you were sent to you, you know, there's some you should do some, you know, um, if people ask you to write a recommendation letter for them, ask them to address it, who does it go to, and give me a paragraph of starter text, and I'll rewrite it. That will help your brain more quickly do that recommendation letter, and, and also do the recommendation letter in a way that the person was um, thinking about, you know, so you might have written it totally off task and off target, and having someone write at least a couple sample sentences that you can include gets your brain going. Starter text can help you accomplish a whole lot more than you ever imagined in your life. Starter text is the, the fuel out there. And that's why chat GPT is not a bad tool if it's used for starter text, right? If it's not used to write your papers, not used to write your recommendations fully, but to give you some starter text, um, which I think is very, very important. Um, People who ask you all the time, let's do lunch, and let's do breakfast. There might be ways to meet with those people in shorter bursts and say, well, I might not have time for breakfast this week or next week, but I can chat on the phone for 10 minutes. And that way you, you've saved 50 minutes that lunch would have taken if you really don't have the time. Sometimes just chatting on the phone. You don't need to have, a lot of people like to do Zoom right away. You don't have to do Zoom or do a face-to-face -face meeting. There's, Something in between is called an email is often will take care of it or a chat on the phone. You know, a phone is much more personal than, you know, many other forms of communication would be. And it's a one way to get things done in more quick fashion. And if you do have a number of people, let's say your research team or your, you know, whatever team, you can meet them all at once and address all their questions in a row or meet people back to back. One of the best ways to save time is doing things back to back to back to back and then in doing them all on the same day. So when I meet the eight of you in this class, I'll meet you all on the same day and talk about your dissertations. I'll do, rather than meeting you over eight different days, that would be a little crazy. So even though it's hard the day in which I meet all eight of you, it, it, you know, and Karen, I can meet, you can be number nine. You know, I can meet all, all, I all of you. What's that? <laughs> I said, thank you. I would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get Sunni remember that. Sunni and I will remember that and we'll schedule in. So, yeah. you know, meet them, you know, in, in a role. And if you teach classes, if you teach undergraduate, if you just sub, if you're an adjunct instructor and they have you doing two classes, ask them to do those two classes on the same day, back to back. And then if you're teaching a Tuesday, Thursday at 10 o'clock, then you do the Tuesday, Thursday at 11.15 or 11.30. And you're doing Tuesday, Thursday, back to back in the mornings. And that's it, rather mm -hmm. than doing a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then if you teach a summer school, ask if you can teach intensive or a, a more shortened kind of courses. Or even in the regular semester, some are eight-week and seven-week courses instead of doing a 16-week. Find ways to be more economical with your time and you can you can accomplish a whole lot more than you would ever have imagined just because you organized your schedule a little bit differently, right? So I'll stop there for a second. So I've gotten through three things. Um, what do you, what what would you like to ask or comment on how how you say no or how you organize your time? Um, maybe we should start with Paula. Do you have any questions or comments about? your time or organizing your time or anything like that? Just, um, well, for me, I, I understand the, the value of saying no, but sometimes I'm wondering since as a future person who will be looking for employment, whether, you know, I really need to show, what is the limit for me to show that I have, you know, the research 
teaching and service, especially service. That, that one is what that bothers me. I think I really need to cut down. So I was pondering about that. If it should be like one of each task, let's say one conference to review, one peer review something, one committee, just to show it was done, but not to over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Early in one's career, I would try and attend those conferences that most of the people in your field attend, like AECT, you know, or AERA or SiteCon, whatever it is, trying to early in the career. So you get to know the other people and they see it FaceTime. And, and, and if you're doing it, sometimes you can leave early in the morning, have a direct flight and get there before the conference starts or early in that day. And then you take the red eye, you know, maybe people don't like the red eye, but you take the right or last afternoon, the late afternoon flight back and get back late at night. And then you might only spend two nights hotel, but get four days at the conference or three, you know, three to four days at the conference, right? In, 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 with more limited costs. So that's one thing I, I can suggest for you there in terms of conferences. In terms of reviews, if you got a friend who asked you to review, maybe that's the one to review for. You, you've kept your connection going. If it's someone out of the blue asking you to review, I got asked to be on a review board last week. I normally would say no, but I suggest because that person I recommended two of my younger colleagues to be on the board or be on the editorial. So they're going to put my two of my younger advisees on the board. And that, that's good and prestigious for them when they go up. So I was thinking about, and then I can talk to these other two about the what they're reviewing, what I'm reviewing and all that. And we can share stories then. Um, in terms of the third thing, service committees, find the higher profile items, not the grunt items. So for me, I sent you all an email about my learning to teach with technology committee, which has having eight technology trainings in the next two months. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my dean, who's a friend of mine, when I sent that to all, I got to send that to all the faculty in the School of Ed with my name attached to it, the email. So that was a way to get your profile raised. And my dean wrote back, that's really great. She used to work with our university technology services. She was in charge. She was really happy to see that. But I got in good graces with her because I chaired the committee that is also a high profile one that has a lot of things going on right now. We're remodeling the library and we're doing other things that is helping the School of Education get better known. Now, it might take more time than other committees, but it's high profile. So you have to balance that between, you know, what's going to take time. and But also it's something with some of these high profile things, you can be more passionate about, you can spend more time, you can be more energized from it. Rather than you do want to be on, don't want to be on is student grievance committee. It's the shortest one typically at a university. I've been on it both at Indiana and at West Virginia. Typically you get one or two grievances a year. It doesn't take much time, but it's the most boring committee you can be on. And you know, I kind of feel sorry for the students who bring a grievance actually, even though often the students are wrong and the professor or the dean is right, you still feel bad for whatever it is. You know, it's one of my one of the students ate uh, bagels with sesame seeds or something like that, and and, and it detected, or or or, or uh, poppy seeds, and poppy seeds can give you a false drug test, and she was kicked out of counseling or school psych because she had a false, you know, test, and you know, uh, and she already was on probation for something else, and so it was a real, you know, it was a heart, some of these are heartbreaking being on student grievance. I would just, you know, just, and, and being on another one to, to maybe avoid a little bit is um, school reform committees, because those can, I, I was on 20 school teacher ed reform in the first three years. <laughs> and once you get on this, they just talk about the same things over and over again. They don't do a whole lot. So find ones in which you can do something that's important, like student travel awards. You're doing something good for students. You're getting in the awards. You're deciding who's going to get them. You know, you, you feel good and, and the students feel good. The, the technology committee, like it, it's a, you know, it's a feel good kind of thing, you know, and I, I, I'd focus on those that you can see where the impact's being made. And so does that all make sense? Yes. Yes. Is that you know, helpful? Yeah. So I didn't get to my tips on writing and publishing. And I've got a lot here. And I think 
I, I can start, but I think we've talked, we've had, we've gone far enough tonight, I think, and I can save this um, unless someone feels I need to get to it. But what do you all, what's your opinion? I personally need to <laughs> leave by 8.30, so. Yep, and Karen? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. We can go to it in the next day. That's fine. Sounds good to me. Everyone else agree? It's a thumbs up. Hey, Zhang, I didn't see anything from you. Okay, so everyone's in agreement. I'm in agreement. We'll reorganize. So in the old days with face-to-face -face classes, I would have agenda like these every week I'd bring them in. I haven't been so good in Zoom bringing in agenda every week. And I also will say I would never get to the last item in the agenda. So we're following just like a face-to-face -face class. We got through everything here, <laughs> but the last item on the agenda, we'll save that, move it over to next week or the week after. Well, we have plenty of time in here. So I wanna thank everyone for, for coming in tonight and participating. And I think breakout rooms were valuable. Um, so I'm gonna stop the yeah. recording and say, thanks for coming to week three in R795. Great to have Yua, Shuya, and Mang Wan with us. I hope they watch the recording.